Bible. Uh, then the last book of the Old Testament, 400 B.C., and that's some say 450. I, I'm just giving approximate dates here. Uh, that's the book of Malachi. That ends the Old Testament. God falls silent for 400 years. Doesn't say anything. That era of time is called B.C., uh, before Christ. Now, if you watch these modern television shows, uh, they'll say B.C.E. B.C.E. What they're trying to do is take Christ out of it. Uh, they're still using the same calendar, but they don't call it B.C. before Christ, but B.C.E., which means before the common era. Uh, so they're using the same calendar, but they don't want to use the name of Christ, so they take his name out of it. But isn't it interesting, back on that point, that we actually measure time from the birth of Christ, going backwards and going forward. Before Christ, year of our Lord. That shows the historicity, the reality, that there was somebody named Jesus here upon the earth because we even measure time from the date of his birth, going forward and going backwards. Uh, but like I say, these modernists, they want to take that out. B.C.E., before the common era, and then instead of A.D., they'll put C.E., which means common era. That's the time we live in now. But most people will use B.C. before Christ. A.D., that's Latin for Anno Domini, or Domini, I'm not sure how that's pronounced. Uh, not a Latin scholar, but that means the year of our Lord. Anno, annual, that's a year. And Domini is a, is a one who, who dominates. He's the Lord. So the year of our Lord, uh, that is, we measure the New Testament. And again, this is all talking about the revelation of the Bible. It's not a complete history of the world. It's just talking about how the Bible came. Uh, but 30 A.D. is the day of Pentecost. That's when the apostles began to speak uh, the revelation of God orally. Uh, and they had the miracles. The, whole, the apostles spoke with tongues and did the various miracles and things like that. Right around about 50 A.D., you had that Jerusalem conference on circumcision. And that's sort of a transitional time because that's when they wrote the first letter, the first epistle. Okay? Uh, that was that letter that they wrote to the Gentile churches that told them you didn't have to be circumcised to keep the law of Moses. Uh, but coming up to that period of time, the, the word of God was just in men. It was orally delivered. I'm talking about the New Testament. Orally delivered. And then they began to set it down on paper. And Paul said in Acts 20, which is probably about eight years after that, he said, for three years I preached the whole counsel of God there in Ephesus. So three years, uh, that take you back to 55. So somewhere between 50 and 55 A.D., the complete revelation of the New Testament is made orally. Again, keep in mind what I'm saying there, verbally, orally. And then they begin to set it down on paper, starting around A.D. 50. It's beginning to be written down. And for a period of time, it's in both men and in the book. It's in verbal and in writing. And then there comes a time when all the writing is finished. Okay? Uh, and that's about the time when the miracles faded away, all the writing is done. The last apostle puts down his pen, doesn't write anymore, and that's it. New Testament is done. 70 A.D., and some will, you know, some will argue with this, some date Revelation later, and that's fine. I want to get into that right now. It's not really, to me, it's not a matter of, of, of a falling out uh, type thing. But Book of Revelation written along in there uh, from my perspective, and that would be the last book. Now it's all in written form, okay? Miracles have ceased. About 100 A.D., just coming right on down the list, and again, that's an approximate date. It's not an official date. We're just trying to put a timeline on so we kind of see how it's unfolding here. They began to collect these things into uh, a common volume that we know of as the New Testament. They collect them, they copy them, they circulate them, uh, uh, and down through the years, that's how it was done. And we're going to find out in Lesson 2 that... There's nothing that exists that was actually handwritten by the Apostle Paul or the Apostle Peter. Those things have perished long ago. Uh, they're ancient books. They've crumbled to dust. And all we have are copies. That's, that's just a fact. And there's no sense of hiding the fact. It's, it's the reality. They're, they're, all we have is copies of those manuscripts. Uh, and uh, as, those cop as you make copies, you know, it's, it, uh, human error creeps in. When you make copies, you make mistakes. And so mistakes kept, crept into the Bible. We'll talk about all of that. I'm just, I'm just trying to be real with you here. Mistakes crept in. That's why some Bibles will say one thing and some Bibles will say something else. And we'll, again, I'm just throwing it out there generically right now, but we'll get into detail on it a little bit later. But some Bibles will say, you know, some manuscripts say this. 
If you look in your notes, some manuscripts say that. And they're trying to tell you that there's differences in the Greek manuscripts as they've been handed down through the years. Uh, but errors entered in. Around 1450 A.D., the printing press was invented. Now, that was a revolutionary invention. The Gutenberg printing press. Ever heard of the Gutenberg Bible? That was the first book ever printed uh, on, on a printing press. They printed a Bible. And uh, now you can make multiple copies. See, back before that, you had to make one copy at a time. <laughs> can you imagine? It, it, it wasn't going to be very many people have their own personal copy of the Bible all the way through because one copy at a time, it was very time-consuming. You'd have to pay that guy, and it would be very expensive to get your own copy of the Bible in those old days. So they would, they would make a copy for the churches, a copy for this church, a copy for that church. And that, so they were few and far between. They were rare uh, they, weren't, they weren't able to be mass produced, but with the invention of the printing press, now you can mass produce them. It's actually going to also reduce the errors because when you make a hundred of these, now you've got a hundred copies of the same thing, whereas if you've got one at a time, I might make a mistake here, I might make another mistake over here when I copy another one, and I might make another mistake over there when I copy another one. So this is going to greatly reduce the number of errors as the thing is copied. In the 1800s, there was, some dis there was a discovery of some very, very, very old ancient manuscripts of the Bible that had previously been undiscovered. That's the reason, by the way, that they came out, you know, for a long, long time, from 1611 until about 1901, about the main translation you had was the King James Version. The reason they came out with the American Standard Version and those that followed was because they discovered these additional manuscripts. So they could now compare those to what they had. They learned, and again we'll get into more detail later, they learned that what they had was in pretty good shape, first of all. But they also learned that there was some differences. So they brought in the American Standard Bible and all the descendants that follow, uh, trying to, and the goal of all this is to make sure we have the most accurate Translation of the Bible. That's the goal of all of this. Now we know there's some side translations off over here and off over there that are paraphrases and stuff. Throw those in the garbage. You don't need the paraphrases. But if you have an actual translation made by scholars, uh, the goal of that is to make sure you have an accurate uh, translation of the Bible that you can understand. Here's another one, 1947. It was a little Bedouin shepherd boy playing out by the caves of the Dead Sea. He picked up a rock threw it into one of those caves, chunk, he heard something crack. And he went in there and he found these big vase-like things. And lo and behold, copies of the Bible found in there. And they were a thousand years older than any of the copies we had prior to that. They were copies of the Old Testament. They were uh, probably uh, the scriptures for the Essenes. That was a, in Jesus' day, you had the scribes, the Pharisees, the Herodians, but you also had the Essenes. You don't read a lot about them in the New Testament because they lived off by themselves, like, kind of like monks, Catholic monks. They lived off by themselves. So they lived over them caves by the Dead Sea, and they had copies of the scriptures, and they'd been sitting in that cave for a thousand years. Nobody knew it. They left them there when the Romans came in to destroy Jerusalem. They left them there and, and they left the caves and, and they discovered them in 1947. And when they brought them out and compared them to what we have today, wow, it was amazing that the Bible had been accurately preserved. You know, a few differences here, a few differences there, but basically what we had was pretty much tracking with what they had even a thousand years earlier than that. That's a testament to the scholars, the scribes, and their attention to detail in copying the scriptures. We'll dig into that a little bit more later on, but I'm just throwing that out there, just kind of introducing the thing right now. But that kind of confirmed the accuracy of the Old Testament with those Dead Sea Scrolls. They are, that was a very, very, very important discovery, and that was just within the last 100 years, less than 100 years ago, 1947. Think about that, that those Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. Okay, questions, comments on lesson one. All right, then, we'll move on to lesson two.
Read your introduction with me here, lesson two. Our first lesson that we just finished up show that the Bible came from God. What I was doing there was actually using the scriptures to kind of paint a picture for you about how we got the Bible. This lesson, we're going to talk about the original text of the Bible and how it was transmitted down through the years. We're going to discuss three things in this lesson. Number one, the languages of the Bible. Number two, the types of books of the Bible. Uh, in, in ancient times, you didn't have a book like this that was hinged in the middle. That you, what you, you had a different kind of book. What, what did it look like? Scroll, yeah, you unroll it. And, and those scrolls would be quite lengthy. And so instead of turning to the page, can you imagine how difficult it would be to read one of those? Instead of turning the page, you unroll to get to here, unroll back this way and get to there, and you have to roll it around uh, to get to the passage that you want. And way back then, they didn't have the chapter and verse divisions either. So you really have to kind of hunt around to find what you're looking for. But that's the way it was. Those were the kind of books they had and what kind of materials they were written on. Things. We'll talk about that. And then... Uh, the last point on this lesson will be talk about the, the scribes, the copiers of the Bible, and, and, and a little bit about that. So first of all, the languages. There are actually three languages in which the Bible was written. Sometimes we short sell that, we say two languages, but the truth is there's three, uh, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Um, and just right out of the bat, if you look at your notes there, because, and I don't think anybody here has that issue that I know of, but it used to be an issue, and it still is in some places. But these people have this idea that, oh, down comes the King James Version directly from heaven, and Paul walked around carrying a King James Bible in his hand. That ain't the way it happened, folks. Uh, the King James Bible uh, is, is in a long list of translations. It's just one of many, many translations that have been made down through the years Paul didn't, didn't just start off with the King James Bible. Paul didn't even speak English. The English language as we know it didn't exist at that time. I said as we know it today. didn't exist at that time. Uh, so God revealed his word slowly over time. Turn, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 1. And uh, the Hebrew writer makes a, a, a nice observation here about God's word. How God spoke to mankind. And he says, uh, verse 1 and 2, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he's appointed of heir, heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. So you get a little bit of a glimpse there about how the Bible came to us, bit by bit, piece by piece, Book by book. It didn't, didn't just all come down whole cloth out of heaven. That's not the way it happened. Uh, it says God spoke at various times. I think the old King James says sundry times. It means the same thing. Sundry times. Um, God spoke at the creation. How did he speak there? Spoke it into existence. Yeah, he spoke it into existence and then uh, spoke directly. Yeah, directly to Adam and Eve. He spoke directly to them. Uh, God spoke... During the Exodus, primarily to Moses, uh, Moses was God's uh, mouthpiece at that time. God spoke uh, during the kingdom days, probably through, mostly through the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and people like that, Obadiah, people like that. Um, uh, there was a prophetic era when the prophets came along and wrote their writings, and during the Christian era. So different times, God's word was revealed at different times. didn't all come down as one solid book from heaven. A little bit here, a little bit there, book here, book there, over the years. Uh, he spoke to various prophets. He said he spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. And so you have the prophet Moses. You have the prophet Isaiah. Uh, the prophet Daniel. Jesus Christ is a prophet. Remember, uh, that was a matter of prophecy in the book of Deuteronomy. The Lord, shall, the Lord your God shall raise up for you a prophet like me. And him you shall hear in all things, whatever he commands you, and it shall come to pass that whoever will not hear that prophet shall be... Anybody remember? Utterly destroyed from among the people. Listen to Jesus or else was the message. And so Jesus was a prophet. He was more than a prophet. He was the son of God, but he was a prophet. Uh, Peter, an apostle. Uh, Paul, an apostle. John, so various prophets down through the years. God spoke in different places. God spoke in the Garden of Eden. God spoke in Ur of the Chaldees. Who did he speak to there? 
<coughs> Abraham, that's right. God spoke in Babylon uh, to Nebuchadnezzar. Remember that? Spoke to Nebuchadnezzar. He's the one who gave Nebuchadnezzar those dreams. Uh, spoke to Daniel. Uh, God spoke uh, in Israel through the prophets. God spoke on the island of Patmos. Where was that? Who, I mean, who was that? John. That was John. That's right. The book of Revelation. So there's John. Uh, and God spoke in different ways, through visions, through dreams, through prophets, through a burning bush. God didn't, it wasn't always the same. It was a variety of things. So you look at that, that Hebrew text there, the first two verses, it kind of summarizes that. God who at various times and in different ways spoke in the past of the fathers by the prophets. Now notice that spoke in the past, that's the Old Testament has in these last days, that's the Christian age, spoken to us by his son. So Jesus is God's final spokesman. Of course, Jesus finishes his message through his chosen apostles. So that includes, that encompasses the apostles, as chapter 2 will bear out. You might flip over there and read that with me. Hebrews 2, verses 3 and 4. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Those who heard him are his apostles. So you got Jesus' personal ministry there in verse 3, and then you got those who heard him, his apostles. So that's God's final message uh, to mankind. Uh, and if you just kind of think about it logically, looking at your outline, we're at 1B now, God had to speak to those people in their language. You know, back in the days of Abraham, the English language as we know it didn't exist. Abraham had a language that he spoke. And so logically God would speak to him in that language. You and I, if we heard that, we wouldn't even understand the message. It would have to be translated for us. Okay? And then you come along into the New Testament time and most of the world spoke Greek. And they didn't speak the language of the Hebrew. They didn't speak Hebrew, but most of the world spoke Greek. That was the, the universal language of the of the Roman Empire at that time, and so God would speak to them in Greek. And that's why your New Testament is written in Greek, see? So God would speak to them logically into their language, otherwise they wouldn't understand them. If God spoke to Abraham in modern-day English, Abraham would say, huh? I don't, I don't know what that means. So he would speak to them in their language. Um, and then all of those writings would be collected into a book. Three languages, as we have up here, Hebrew. Let me see if I can get this out. We've got about a minute left here. Hebrew. Uh, most of the Old Testament, probably a good 95% of it or more, was written in Hebrew. That was the language of Abraham's descendants. The Hebrew language, and on the back, the second page of this, I, put, I, put, I found these online so you can kind of get a flavor of that Hebrew alphabet. Look at that. That looks like squiggles to me. What about you? Can you read that? That's just the alphabet, by the way. Uh, but the Hebrew alphabet, uh, and then un underneath that's the Aramaic alphabet. There's a lot of similarities between those two. Hebrew looks a little fancier to me, but some of the letters are very similarly formed. Okay, But still, when I look at that, it just looks like squiggles to me. Nice orderly squiggles, but squiggles nevertheless. It doesn't look like letters to me at all. Now, if you were a Hebrew scholar, you would be able to read that just fine. Uh, but that, that's the Hebrew language. And then on the back page, Greek. And what I got there, I don't know for sure if that's modern Greek or Koine Greek. I'm not sure which that is, but those are the capital letters that I have there. Uh, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Uh, and, and, you know, alpha is the first letter. The last letter down there on the third row is omega. And when Jesus said, I am the alpha and the omega, I am the A to the Z, I am the first and the last, see? And so he's, he's speaking in the Greek language there. But... The, the, the Hebrew alphabet, going back to page one real quick, and I, I'm, I'm, I'll have to stop here, but the Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters. How many letters does our alphabet have? 26. 26. Yeah. Hebrew language has 22 letters, no vowels. In other words, to put it in English, there is no A-E-I-O-U in Hebrew. There's no vowels. It's all consonants. <laughs> That's, that would be odd, wouldn't it? But the Hebrew alphabet has no vowels. Uh, later copyists would put in what they call vowel points to help with the pronunciation of the old Hebrew words. You know, if you were conversant with Hebrew, you wouldn't need that. But as time goes on and that becomes a dead language, you would add the vowel points uh, for pronunciation's sake and, and things of that, letter, uh, of that nature. But 22 letters, no vowels. 
The Hebrew language is read from right to left, backwards for us. We read from left to right. Hebrew, that's why I've got at home, I've got a, what they call a Hebrew interlinear. And that's where you've got the Hebrew text and a direct English translation right underneath it. And you have to, you have to kind of train your eyes to do this because when you look at it, you have to go from right to left. And if you start going left to right, you're going to say, this doesn't make any sense. That's not what the Bible says. But you have to go this way with it because Hebrew is read from right to left. So it's an adjustment. It's like the British, they drive on the wrong side of the road. You know? <laughs> and the Germans do too. We'll drive on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> but it's the same thing with their alphabet. Uh, the Hebrew alphabet reads backwards. And I've gone way over time. I'm sorry. I'll shut up. <laughs>